Today, I want to step back in time to an age of wonder, imagination, and fantasy. That time is the year 2005. But why are we here, you say? Well, today, my fellow Halo fan, we've come together to discuss one of the first major debates in the Halo franchise. You see, our trend of fighting over which niche and inconsequential feature has totally and utterly ruined Halo didn't start with Halo 5. It didn't start at Halo 4. It didn't even start at Halo Reach. No. Our eternal struggle to decide what has ruined Halo forever picked up the moment the original game got a sequel. And our culprit? None other than the Arbiter. I'm the Home Slice Ascend Hyperion, and in today's video, I want to guide you through a collective argument that was waged nearly 15 years ago. Today, I'll try to explain why Halo fans in 2005 were convinced the inclusion of our now fan favorite Splitjaw equaled the full falling off point for the Halo story. Be sure you subscribe and make sure you don't miss my viewer question at the end. Let's get this started. Right, so here we are. The year is 2005. Halo 2 is in its infantile months post launch, but enough time has passed to allow Halo fans across the world to do the one thing any game dev fears talk on forums. A general opinion was forming. We hate the Arbiter, the fans cry out. The Arbiter campaign has ruined Halo! But how, you might ask? Well, to understand, we need to rewind a little further. The year is 2003, and Halo 2 is attending E3 this year with a full-blown gameplay demo. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the one. Master Chief is fighting a new Mombasa, the BR is single fire, there's an explosion every 15 seconds, dual wielding and vehicle hijacking are revealed, yada yada. Needless to say, fans are pretty hyped. And it's right here where we incur our number one issue. Fans are hyped. Hype is great and all to generate buzz for your game, but it also has one very nasty side effect. Speculation. Now, in my humble opinion, speculation is one of the worst things that can be generated about a game. Speculation, either intentionally or unintentionally, generates expectation, wherein people convince themselves that the speculation is sound enough to believe that the speculated item will be present in the real game, even if they have no real tangible evidence to back that up. This would be fine and dandy at all if gamers were mature, level-headed thinkers, uh, but we both know this isn't the case. So, after Halo 2 gameplay demo was released, fans went back to the web and started developing a dangerous and popular speculation. Over the following weeks, a massive idea is adopted. Halo 2 will be all about saving Earth. It'll be even bigger and badder alien slaughter fest than Halo CE. And now we're on home turf, boys! Halo CE might have been about stopping the fire in the ring, but Halo 2 will be right over the and then the game came out. In case you haven't played Halo 2, here's the skinny. Halo 2 is not about saving Earth, not in the way people thought it'd be, and ironically, the little bit from the E3 trailer didn't even make it into the final game. It was literally all scrapped right after E3, because none of it could actually run on an Xbox. Furthermore, we spend all of what, one mission actually on Earth, then it's right back to space again. But here's what really busted the hype train up. The campaign is now split between the Chief and a new character, a freaking elite. Oh, and did we mention the aliens talk now? And they have religion, and politics, and monkeys? It's pretty easy to see how this all deviated from the would-be kick-ass, take-names, chew-bubblegum story people were expecting. But this is only part of the issue, because when compared to Halo CE, the Arbiter campaign is still a massive narrative kickflip. People were cool to assume that Halo 2 was going to be an alien slaughter fest because at the end of the day, that's what Halo CE was. I mean, imagine how different people would have reacted if after the success of Pac-Man, Mrs. Pac-Man turned out to be a deep dive exploration of the great Pac economy, coupled with a gripping story of an orphan ghost simply trying to make a living in this ever-changing world. Where were we? So what I'm saying is that there was a massive deviation from what the players were both used to and expecting versus what they actually got. So, it's upon this foundation our war against the Arbiter develops. 
You see, enraged fans had to channel their anger about the Covenant campaign through one key item, and what other item was more apt as a sacrificial lamb than the Arbiter? Fans claimed the Arbiter storyline was inconsequential, asserting that for the most part, the Arbiter's missions could have been skipped, but instead they occupy a massive chunk of the campaign time. Furthermore, some argued it was all very uninteresting. Since the character was brand new, his fall from supposed grace didn't really mean much to the player, so nothing about him being the Arbiter seemed that great or tragic. This one I think is a little fair. In 2004, our understanding of the Covenant was pretty limited, especially if you just played Halo CE and pursued no other game media. We're just sort of thrown into the Arbiter storyline and expected to not only accept a fairly massive change to the Covenant's writing, but we're supposed to understand the gravity of everything related to being the Arbiter. In fact, when you really think about it, the Arbiter's character is tossed in very fast, since he makes absolutely no appearance in Halo CE but was also supposedly the leader of the Covenant forces you encounter in that game. I mean, doesn't it all seem fast? Anyway, people's dislike for the Arbiter managed to persist long after the game's release. In fact, by the time we reached 2007, on the cusp of Halo 3, people reignited the anti-Arbiter bid, claiming that one of the key things Halo 3 had to do in order to make sure it was a hit was to keep the Arbiter out of it. One gaming magazine even stated the Arbiter shouldn't even be a playable character in co-op. And here's the craziest thing to me. It worked. I mean, if you've played Halo 2 and Halo 3 and really paid attention, you'd notice the Arbiter got a serious role reduction in Halo 3. Hell, it was one thing to cut him out of having his own story, but in Halo 3 he hardly even talks. That's pretty major, considering in Halo 2 we see the Arbiter to be highly articulate and conversational. But I think Bungie got extremely scared of facing any more backlash for letting characters beside the Chief have limelight, because basically all the characters in Halo 3 got a massive role reduction. This is a fun topic for me, because right now, the Halo franchise is populated highly by people who were only kids when they played Halo 2, and I think it's fair to assume many of us in this age range have very fond memories and appreciation of the Arbiter and his storyline. But because of the outrage incited by older fans back in 2005 onward, by the time we got to Halo 3, any chance we might have had of seeing the Arbiter's character develop further were virtually squashed. It's also just as important to note that these people in that age range aren't really around anymore. We've seen the numbers. It's a good anchor point for me when I wager my Halo opinions against those of younger fans, and I want to give you guys this anchor as today's big viewer question. What's more important, satisfying the people who are already veteran fans, or satisfying the people who will become the next generation of veteran fans? Whether people want to admit it or not, I've seen the data. You will age out of this fandom. How much time does your desire for the franchise have with you? versus the people who will come after you. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Anyway, that does it for today's video. If you have Twitter, you should swing over and give me a follow on there. I post jokes, terrible comments from the channel, it's pretty chill. And if you've made it this far and you haven't subscribed, you should probably go ahead and bite the bullet. It's worth it. Until next time, I'll catch you guys later.